value added tax. Revenue generated by customs. Revenue generated by ministries, departments, and agencies of government. That is arising from the interpretation of the Constitution here. There is nothing that says you cannot have a kind of a preliminary arrangement of existing accounts. But what matters at the end of the day is that revenue. If you have, for example, a revenue being maintained, dedicated to asset recovery for the purpose of transparency and accountability of it, at the end of the day, the money that goes into the asset recovery account find its way to which account? To the account being referred to under section 162, which indeed the federation account. So the federation is entitled to have sub accounts. But sub accounts, the content, lodgements, monies in the sub account must eventually find, them, find its way into the federation account for the purpose of appropriation which is the function of the National Assembly. So the existence of asset recovery account, the existence of the customs account, the existence of a TSA, what do you call it, a single treasury account, is not outruled by the interpretation or by the implication of section 142 of the, 162, sorry, 162 of the Constitution. But then what the emphasis arriving from 162 is that all the monies must naturally go into the Federation account and then it is the responsibility of the National Assembly to appropriate same accordingly. So that is the spirit of it. The idea of having asset recovery account is not approved by section 162 of the Constitution, Mr. Chairman. Act. And in that law, you will now establish the possibility of this asset recovery account. The poker. So where you find a breach is if the monies are utilized from the account without recourse to appropriation, without being deposited into the federation account. And at the end of the day, it's, it's about transparency. How much money do we realize for asset recoveries? you refer to the asset recovery account to get that. How much money was realized from the customs? For one, uh, Ibrahim Abubakar, and then you seek to know whether I know any Ibrahim Abubakar. So when my reaction, my response, and my position is, I do not know any Ibrahim Abubakar. I have no relationship with him, and I do not know. She for he, so there is no point asking why only one woman <laughs> followed you. Thank you very much, you are welcome. Uh, because we've taken introductions before you came, but um, still we want you equally to familiarize yourself with uh, members of the committee at this end. So, uh, from my far left, uh, evidences. Uh, but at the same time, since your office in particular, it's the intricate machinery that revolves around the legal system in the country. So. There are areas of concerns and that you suppose to address the committee uh, before a final uh, report, which we believe that um, will be implemented by the appropriate authorities. Who knows? Some may even come to your office for implementation. However, at this stage, I will. Um, want to I will want to draw your attention to a document before us here and uh, not necessarily to speak to the document you you kindly read through I'll get it back then I'll talk thereafter. Thank you. Uh, where is the clerk? But that it is indeed our intention to make 
copious submission of documents. And these documents are handy and being processed. But let me state that on account of the volume of the documents, on account of the fact that they are far reaching, far reaching in the sense that they cut across ministries, departments, and agencies of government, it is logical that uh, much time is required, much time has been taken in processing and compiling them. But let me state that I have developed out of desire to make it easy for, for reference purposes, a template that I think could be very material and relevant in terms of easing the investigative process of the committee. And I have taken time as well to respond item by item to, I think, about over 30 questions that were raised in one of the correspondence by the committee. Sorry, over to two correspondents relating to the item under investigation. So, in as much as uh, I would like to proceed, as I stated earlier, but let me state on record that they are bringing in the documents while this proceeding is ongoing. And if arriving from the document, there is need for further engagement, even while we are proceeding, I'm available to make myself available for the purpose of supporting what we are doing. But for, uh, regardless of the circumstances, let me state further that as a government, we are indeed happy with what you are doing as far as oversight functions of investigation associated with uh, revenue loss on oil and gas sector and the industry. And we have demonstrated the desire and ability to be of help, to be of support to whatever will add up the transparency and accountability of the system. And it is with that background in mind that I will be wholeheartedly available to support whatever you intend to do, whatever you are doing as far as this investigative hearing is concerned. So for the record, for record purposes, I'm available, I am ready, I have developed a copious response to the issues raised, and I will now make myself wholeheartedly available in response of the queries and investigations that you might wish to attend. Now coming to the document, I will read it. I, 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 sorry? Your own or the one I just gave? Yes, your own. Okay. All right. Okay. I will go through and then. First, I need clarification as to who the Protect the World organization is. I have, I, and, and their business as far as this investigative hearing is concerned, and the eventual request on their part for closed door. I am here for open door in all sincerity, and I'm averse to anything closed. Anything closed, I'm averse to it. I'm here for open engagement for the Nigerians to see. I am here on behalf of Nigerians, and I want, to hear, and I want Nigerians to share in what we are doing for the purpose of transparency and accountability of it. I have indeed promoted uncountable bills that were passed by the National Assembly deepening the transparency and accountability process of the government of President Muhammadu Buhari, and the idea of closed door for me does not arise at all, as far as this investigative hearing is concerned. Yes. Uh, please get it right, though. See, we, uh, Attorney General, yes, we are not our both parties, mm. justice, okay? And uh, the, it's to protect the institution of the National Assembly and yeah. that of uh, the government of the Federation of Nigeria. Hmm. We're supposed there to have an insight into. I don't even know their locals uh, in as far as I'm much less of conceiving. <laughs> so, uh, okay. so mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, people can be funny. Yeah. And, uh, that is what we see at this end. Yes, please. So there is nothing. Maybe that even to uh, as much as maybe they are, they are faceless. We don't know. Well, uh, <laughs> so we better have a case for us to engage them. Okay, so this process is thank possible. you very much. So, um, can you be in a kind of a communication gap between yes. this committee and your office? Yes, please. Sir. And um, it seems if you had taken time to close it, uh, probably there would not be kind of um, misconception. Yeah. Uh, we 
would not have taken it as if you are refusing to come and appear before this committee. Uh, with due respect to your, to your person and your office. Thank you very much. So, um, now that you have made clarification, at the same time, you know, uh, every com even standing committee uh, has a time they have to fold up and submit reports as far as the investigative hearing is concerned. So, which is similar akin to what we are doing here. Um, we, we, by the time you address us, we want to know when we are going to have those documents uh, before the week runs out, so that we too will spend the weekend to review them. And on Tuesday, we can just meet again and go to that. I'm not ruling yet. I'm only trying to give you an insight because we are equally not going to keep uh, you for too long. So please, you can address us. Thank you very much. We are too. So they said uh, they've decided I should go on while right. other people okay. are doing what they're supposed to. Right, Mr. Chairman, received about three letters from the committee. The first letter received by the office of the Attorney General was a letter dated 12th day of January 2023. And then it was followed off with a letter dated 22nd day of March 2023, which was further followed off with a letter dated 3rd day of April 2023. My presentation before you, Mr. Chairman, will be a presentation that will address the issues captured in these letters, seriatim, one after the other. I now begin with the first letter. And in the first letter, there are questions that I would like to take jointly, questions one to five of the first letter. Arising from those questions, the committee seeks details of information on whistleblowers and associated recoveries processed by the Office of the Attorney General. And I have taken pains, Mr. Chairman, to produce what I call table Two that comprises of annexures A to I, which indeed provided a comprehensive detail of the whistleblowers and associated recoveries. So the documents that are to be shared, Mr. Chairman, will give you a general insight as to the information on whistleblowers and associated recoveries processed by the Office of the Attorney General, and uh, you will find them accordingly incorporated. So for notice purposes, a response to questions one to five of the first letter are developed and contained in table two. And in table two, you have in support thereof an extras A to I. The whistleblower policy is indeed coordinated by the Federal Ministry of Finance. For your information, Federal Ministry of Finance, Budget and National Planning is the coordinator of the whistleblowing policy. And all payments to whistleblowers are made by the Federal Ministry of uh, Finance, Budget and National Planning. And it is a poor position to provide further details. It is to be noted that the whistleblowing thrive on confidentiality and protection of information. Therefore, disclosing the details of the whistleblowers at a public hearing breaches confidentiality provision of which the Office of the Attorney General was committed to arriving from the whistleblowers on account of their personal security and the national security. So arising from that consideration, I have taken funds to develop the information taking into consideration the confidentiality element of it, but then providing same for the consideration of the committee exclusively. 
So the table that I have developed provides all those details uh, for the consumption of the committee. So that is it for questions one to five as contained in the first letter. Question six uh, demanded a report on the details of accounts from which recoveries were made. And I equally developed what I call uh, table two. And next choice A to I provided the information about the local accounts from which recoveries were made. Further details of the international accounts, expenditure, statement of accounts are obtainable from the Central Bank of Nigeria. For the information of the committee, the office of the Attorney General do not maintain the custody of an account. All accounts associated with the recoveries, generally speaking, are being maintained by the Central Bank and are being often on the request of the Office of the Attorney General and then open on the directives of the Office of the Accountant General. As far as being a signatory or in any way being responsible in the management of such accounts as concerned, the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation is in no way connected whatsoever. So whatever information that may be required as it relates to the details of the signatories, details of the management, details of the disbursement associated with the account, I suggest that the Federal Ministry of Finance, the Office of the Accountant General, and the Central Bank are the exclusive custodians, managers, and the operators of the account, and not the Office of the Attorney General, for record purposes. So the Office of the Attorney General does not have at its disposal a single account relating to the management, operations, and coordination of the recovered asset uh, in respect of which disbursements are being exclusively carried out by the Office of the Attorney General. That answers question six. So what I'm saying, in essence, reference on details, signatories, disbursement, associated information on the, asset, uh, on the uh, uh, recovery accounts should be routed to the Central Bank, Office of the Accountant General, and indeed the Federal Ministry of Finance that are the, uh, the operators, maintainers, custodians of these accounts in question. Now I go to the, uh, oh, sorry, no, uh, items, uh, sorry, question 17 to 12. The spirit of the questions as contained were details available to HO, uh, Office of the Attorney General contained table two, uh, sorry. Possession of the recovered funds. That is the spirit of question 7 to 12. Property, petroleum product, etc. It is in this respect that I want to reiterate further that the office of the attorney general is not a custodian of a couple. But I think it is important at this juncture to draw the attention of the committee to a point. And that point is to give you an idea of what recoveries were made within the period of six years by the Office of the Attorney General. And all these recoveries, not a cobble relating thereto, is in the custody of the Office of the Attorney General. So for example, for the purpose of refreshing your memory, the Office of the Attorney General was instrumental in 2017 in the recovery of $322 million. Where is the money? The money was lodged into the asset recovery account of the federal government, open at the instance of the Federal Ministry of Finance on the request of the Office of the Attorney General, maintained by the Office of the Accountant General, in whose custody, in CBN's custody, that money was not there, not an account being operated, maintained by the Office of the Attorney General. Again, in, uh, in 2020, the Office of the Attorney General was instrumental in the recovery of $311.4 million from uh, uh, Belwick, Jersey, US and UK. That money was lodged into the uh, asset recovery account of the federal government, being maintained in the central bank 
often at the instance of the Federal Ministry of Finance and the Office of the Accountant General. Nobody in the Office of the Attorney General was a signatory or responsible for the operations and coordination of the account. Again, uh, there was equally additional amount of 5.4 million recovered in 2020 from I Northern Ireland relating to Abacha. The same amount was loaded into the asset recovery of the uh, uh, federal government being maintained by the office of the uh, being maintained at the central bank. Again, there was additional sum of 4.2 billion uh, uh, pounds recovered relating to James Ibori, not lodged in an account maintained by the office of the uh, attorney general, but maintained at the central bank. Again, we equally recovered additional amount of 20 million recently in August 2022 known as Mecosta, lodged where in the asset recovery of the federal government maintained at the central bank. Again, we equally recovered additional sum of 954 pounds uh, from, uh, I mean, illicit funds linked to DSP Alamesia. It was equally lodged at the account. I will give, make a copy of the, I mean, I mean that submission available as well, if it is not part of what you have. So what I'm saying, in essence, for clarification purposes, for the purpose of setting aside any ambiguity in case any has set in as to considerations associated with recoveries is no account is being maintained in the Federal Ministry of Justice for the purpose of um, as a, a recovered asset and all the monies recovered at the instance or by the office of the Attorney General by Federal Ministry of Justice were indeed lodged into an account maintained with the central bank in respect of which the attorney, neither the Attorney General nor staff of Federal Ministry of Justice is a signatory. Now I proceed, Mr. Chairman. Relating to questions 13 and 14, that is details of compensation paid and engagement of recovery agents. I equally provided what is referred to among the documents we are submitting as table two. And in it, you have an exhaust A to I, which provides the details of compensation. But let me give you an insight as to the way and manner compensations relating to recoveries are being conducted. I will take an example with the case of 322 million recovered from Switzerland. A recovery agent that approached the office of the Attorney General for the purpose of recovery will now be engaged for file. And an agreement eventually is drafted and signed, spelling the terms on the basis of which the recovery will be conducted. Generally speaking, ever since the coming in place of this government, no recovery has exceeded 5% professional fees for the services. And the fee is contingent on wholehearted recovery. No cobo is advanced by the federal government or the office of the attorney general for, the, for recovery purposes. So now, if you are engaged formally, engagement documents are signed, and then you are now supported to go ahead and make recoveries. When recoveries are eventually effected, lodgements are made into the asset recovery account of the federal government. There exist asset recovery accounts maintained at the central bank, open, at the inst uh, open by the office of the accountant general of the federation, and on the request of the office of the attorney general, because we are making recoveries, we have to know where and when these monies being recovered are to be lodged. So if the money is eventually lodged, the recovery agent will write to the Attorney General, we have concluded the recovery process and seek to be paid our fees as agreed. Then the Office of the Attorney General take fence to write to the Central Bank of Nigeria demanding confirmation of lodgement as claimed by the recovery agent. The central bank will now confirm if indeed the recovery has been effected and then support the request for confirmation 
with a statement of account establishing that the money had indeed been lodged into the account. So it is at that point that the office of the Attorney General developed a letter to the office, uh, to the Honorable Minister of Finance, intimating the minister that please recall that social recovery agent has been engaged by the, several, uh, by the federal government. Be informed that the recovery agent has succeeded in recovering these funds as agreed. Be further informed that he has notified the office of the Attorney General that the process was concluded and the office of the Attorney General requested for confirmation from the Central Bank. We further inform that the Central Bank has confirmed the receipt of this money into the asset recovery account. I find attached the one, the evidence of engagement of the recovery agent. Two, correspondence by the office of the Attorney General to the Central Bank. Three, confirmation by the Central Bank of the receipt of the money. Now process the professional fee of the recovery agent in view of the fact that recovery process is concluded. What I'm saying in essence, the office of the Attorney General simply is a nabbler in the process, driver of the process to ensure that payment is effected to recovery agent. Is not in any way disbursing a couple. Is not in control of the account and has no control whatsoever and is not a signatory to the account. That is the process as far as a recovery is concerned. I proceed, Mr. Chairman. Coming to item 15, uh, question number 15. HAGF's office did not constitute any, whether we are, the inquiry there was whether there was any committee constituted by the office of the Attorney General on the investigation of whistleblower information. No. In case there are issues, perhaps incidental to whistleblowing, either of criminality or associated things, it is never the responsibility of the Office of the Attorney General to investigate. Investigation, naturally, is exclusive functions of agencies, certain responsibilities for that. For information arriving from the laws that you have passed over time, uh, the police are indeed saddled with the responsibility of investigation, ICFC does, EFCC does, among others. So whenever there is need for any investigation arising from certain infractions, what the Office of the Attorney General do in case any petition is received associated with any need for investigation is to refer the petition or request for investigation to the relevant investigative authorities and they will eventually investigate and return the investigation report to the Office of the Attorney General for action. If arising from the investigation of the police, EFCC, ICPC, the Director of Public Prosecution is of the opinion that there are prima facie grounds, reasonable grounds for action, perhaps maybe for prosecution, their prosecution is now considered in view of the investigation report as provided by the police. So the idea of the Office of the Attorney General constituting an investigation committee is out of it. Office of the Attorney General 100% wholeheartedly rely on investigation report by either the police, ICPC, EFCC, or such other agencies of government that are saddled with the responsibility for investigation. Except perhaps if the investigation in issue is administrative one in line with the public service rules perhaps, but then any investigation that has to do with criminality, that has to do with um, serious issues of oversight among others are not the function of the Office of the Attorney General and the Office of the Attorney General does not engage itself in investigation. Now, um, question number 16 to 19. As to whether formal committee was constituted to HAGF's knowledge uh, relating to, which item is it? Uh -huh. Yes. Well, on 48 million barrels allegation, Mr. Chairman, let me state on record and for the benefit of Nigerians and the committee, 
that the allegations relating to the 40 what? 48 million barrels are, yes, are baseless. The allegation is unpounded. It's lacking in merit and indeed lacking in substance. It is in its own right the allegation devoid of any reasonable ground pointing to a material suspicion and cogent enough to invoke the constitutional oversight of the committee. Why do I say so? Mr. Chairman, sometimes in 2016, allegations were arrived and hyped in the social media. There were allegations of existence of stolen 48 million barrels of Nigerian crude oil in China, said to have been valued at 2.4 billion. The president, President Mahmoud Buhari, informally requested the Attorney General, making reference to my humble person, Mele Kiari, former DGSS, Lawal Daura, and late Abba Kiari, to look into it and advise. But unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, for there to be a reasonable ground for suspicion, at least you require certain basic facts. If you are talking of a product, you cannot establish the substance relating thereto without confirming the origin of the purported product in China. If you talk of a product in China, is it of Nigerian origin? That can be established by way of sample and specifications. Is it Boni Light, for example, which you know apparently emanates from Nigeria, or what is it? The basic details of the existence of the product and connecting it to Nigeria was not there at all. If you are talking of a product, a vessel perhaps, that has taken it, where, what are the particulars and details of the vessel? They were not available at our disposal at all. If you are talking of apprehension, confoundment in China, which authority is it that had indeed taken custody of the product? No information at all. So, Your Excellency, Mr. Chairman, the issue is simple. Yes, I elevating, I'm elevating your position for the purpose of it. Yes, the information is simple. There were no reasonable grounds for suspicion of the fact that the purported oil product either exists in spirit or in fact or indeed exists in China and is in no way connected with Nigeria. And all efforts on our part to get details had proven abortive. So it was a committee that was dead on arrival because it has not been formally constituted and then our informal findings does not support, suggest or provide an information that could now support. So we could not, Mr. Chairman, establish the substance in the allegation because detailed information to confirm the existence and origin of the shipments such as sample of the oil, vessels involved, loading point, ETC, location of the crude in, in China, ETC, were not provided. So we reported to the President that we were unable to confirm the veracity of the allegations, hence no further action was taken by my office, and no trip whatsoever was embarked upon to China, of which the Attorney General was a party. I wasn't a party, I wasn't aware of the existence, I wasn't aware of the formation of any formal committee. So that is, in simple sense, my response relating to the purported, what do you call it, 2 4 what? Uh -huh. uh, purported uh, crude oil in China. So since issues associated with 
lifting of crude, specifications, details, and perhaps maybe disposal are issues within the ambit and scope of the powers of NNPC, my suggestion to the committee, if, they were, if the committee wishes to extend its oversight functions, is NNPC has the mandate of marketing Nigeria's crude oil, the committee may wish to refer further to NNPC for further information. Attorney General does not have one. That is my conclusion on that. Now, question number 20. It is about whether the Office of the Attorney General received petition from Advocacy for Good Governance and Free Nigeria, dated 17th March 2019, reporting a case of criminal intimidation. It is true that the Office of the Attorney General received a petition from Advocacy for Good Governance and uh, Free Nigeria, which petition is dated 17th March 2019. 19. It was reporting a case of criminal intimidation and threat to life, conspiracy using forged documents, including a, a letter purportedly written by President Buhari to gain access to public institutions, forgery, blackmail, and extortion of government functionaries, contrary to the provisions of Section 397. 96, 242, 286, 332, 362, and 291 of the final court perpetrated by an international criminal network comprising of foreign and Nigerian nationals. And the nationals, or perhaps the personalities involved against whom the petition was written, were one Marco. Namires, Jose Salaza, Tina Jaro, Andrew Macaulay, Francis Ibomo, and Kelvin Ibomo. A copy of the petition, Mr. Chairman, was provided and attached as an extra one of table three among the documents that are going to be shared by the Office of the Attorney General. So the petitioners also alleged that the suspects met with the informant and told him of their business association with a kind of businessman who allegedly engaged them in a business to recover stolen crude belonging to Nigerian government from China. That crude you are making a subject of investigation is what is being referred to in the petition under consideration, Mr. Chairman. And to their greatest surprise, the defendants were in possession of sensitive documents with which they claim to have been engaged by the federal government of Nigeria. So they also claimed to have executed the job for which they were engaged and uh, appealed with the informant to borrow their money. So these people, the subjects, were claiming to have been engaged by the federal government and they claimed they requested for certain disbursement by someone, a, bus uh, a businessman in Nigeria, and they were seeking for money from him. So I think the amount involved was 100 million naira. So the petition, often receipt of the petition, I told you earlier in my submission that it is not the responsibility of the office of the attorney general to embark on investigation, but prosecution, yes. So what happened? Often receipt of the petition, the petition was forwarded together with the attachments to the inspector general of police, pursuant to a letter from the Office of the Attorney General dated 22nd March 2019 for investigation. A copy of the letter was attached as an extra two in table three. It will be made available to the committee also. So what are we doing here? Well, I mean, arising from uh, the investigation of perhaps criminality associated with these people that are claiming to have worked for Nigeria in the recovery of the purported uh, oil product in China was to was referring the letter to the office of the uh, inspector general of police for investigation taking into consideration that they made far reaching allegations one the existence of the crude two that they have assisted nigeria in recovering the fruit uh, the the, uh, the product three 
Where is the money if you have indeed assisted in Nigeria in identifying the crude, recovering them, and where is the money lodged? All these things calls for extensive investigation by an agency responsible for so doing. So the matter was referred to who? To the Inspector General of Police for investigation. And then, for your information, Mr. Chairman, two investigation reports were received. One is dated 29th April 2019 and second 27th May 2019. They are equally provided for the consideration of the committee and they are attached to our document as an extra three of table four. They were forwarded to the Deputy uh, Inspector General of Police Force Criminal Investigation Department wherein a prima facie case of fraud. So this time around it is not about the recovery of the product. But the fact that these people in contention were fraudulent, they simply were trying to establish a case against the federal government to extort the federal government, and they were laying foundation that one, there was indeed a product belonging to the federal government, two, they have worked for the federal government, even when the federal government has not seen the product, even when the federal government has not recovered a dime out of the purported product. So the conclusion of the Inspector General of Police was that there existed fraud, inclusive of the use of the letter-headed paper of the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria by these personalities. So, and uh, defamation of character of the government um, uh, functionaries, including Mr. President, which was viewed as constituting a threat to national security, which was um, apparent arising from the investigation of the Inspector General of Police. So the idea of the product does not arise. But the idea of syndicate, fraudulent syndicate, trying to extort money from the federal government was by the investigation of the inspector established, and that was what we followed. So what happened? Accordingly, charges were filed in court, warrant of arrest was issued for the arrest of the suspect for the purpose of prosecution. However, only Marco, Remares, and Francis Imobo were arrested as the rest of the suspects were at large. So, based on the investigation report, I approved the filing of the criminal charge against the suspect. And the charge, for your information, Mr. Chairman, was indeed filed in court and it was registered in court as charge number FCT slash HC slash BW slash CR slash 134 slash 19 and it is dated 31st day of May 2019 and it was indeed filed on uh, 3rd June 2019. It was later amended on 20th March 2020. Mr. Chairman, copy of the charge as filed was made part of the documents that are being made available for your consideration. Now, the charge for information, Mr. Chairman, distinguished honorable members, is currently pending before the FCT High Court, JB. It came up for hearing on the fourth day of April, 2023, and is adjourned to ninth day of May, 2023, for trial. Now, it is to be noted that the matter had suffered several adjournments due to non-availability of the suspects to continue trial. After they were granted bail, one of the suspects, Marco Ramirez, was, was as well further arrested by EFCC and currently detained at the Crickery Medium Correctional Facility awaiting trial at the Federal High Court at, at the instance of ES EFCC on different criminal charges. Uh -huh. So, what happened further? The Central Authority Unit, which is a department in the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation, is also in receipt of extradition request against one member of the group, Marco Remares, for other financial crimes committed against Nigerians in a Ponzi immigration scheme for which he is wanted in the United States of America. So the request is pending, as we are yet to agree with the US Department of Justice 
on the return of the proceeds of crime to compensate the Nigerians. So the same guy was alleged to have now a kind of, uh, have in place, be a party to a Ponzi scheme where Nigerians were defrauded. We have taken steps to ensure that the monies of Nigerians were returned back to them. We are discussing with the uh, US, USDOG over the matter. So the US equally are looking for the man. He is there in Kirikiri. And he's the same man that is saying that this uh, crude oil uh, has, in the Nigerian crude oil was taken and he has assisted Nigeria in recovering the crude oil. He is now looking to be paid for the services rendered. No services other than criminal services were rendered as far as his presence in Nigeria is concerned. Now, kindly, Mr. Chairman, note that this major accomplice, Mr. Jose Salares, has conned to Mexico and is a fugitive from justice. So since there is no bilateral treaty between Nigeria and Mexico, our efforts to seek his extradition to Nigeria are yet to produce fruitful response. We are making effort to equally now have the other guys that absconded to Mexico extradited back to Nigeria. So, um, however, we are in touch with the Mexican authorities to agree on the use of United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime uh, uh, legal basis for the request. So that is it for table one. I, de I developed the response in tables. So this one relates to the first letter establishing questions. Now I proceed to table 1B, Mr. Chairman. Table 1B for question 1 to 3, raise, which is indeed a letter dated 3rd April 2023. For question 1, please I refer you to my response to question 16 to 19 in table one. They share similarities, they are on all fours, and I rest my case by way of relying on such response in response to questions one to three of um, the letter dated April 23. Uh, question four in the said letter, where they said there was an allegation of a one uh, Ibrahim Abubakar, and then you seek to know whether I know any Ibrahim Abubakar. So one, my reaction, my response, and my position is, I do not know any Ibrahim Abubakar. I have no relationship with him, and I do not know any details associated with him. So the committee may wish to provide more information on these persons and transactions, or perhaps may as well consider the possibility of referring Ibrahim, uh, the issues associated with Ibrahim Abubakar to perhaps the Inspector General of Police, EFCC or associated agencies. Because um, I, I know very well, it is not, and I deny connection in whatever form, manner and respect to any purported Ibrahim Abubakar. But my take and my counsel and suggestion to the committee is the committee feels strongly about that, um, um, uh, about the issue of Ibrahim Abubakar, I suggest to the committee to consider the possibility of referring issues associated with him to the relevant investigation agencies for further investigation. But for Attorney General, I have no relationship with any Ibrahim Abubakar. I do not know him. I have no relationship, no engagement with him. Now, uh, on questions five, I wish to state that whenever my office receives a petition that requires investigations, such is usually forwarded to an appropriate law enforcement agency. It is not the requirement of the law that the Office of the Attorney General must investigate the identity or legal juristic personality of a petitioner before acting on complaint or petition. Office of the Attorney General is guided by substance. If we, are, we form an opinion that there exists a substance of the, in the petition, whether it is indeed anonymous or identified or tied to an individual, we investigate. So there is a provision for anonymous petition and we're still blowing. The emphasis is on the content, substance and presence of reasonable suspicion or cause of action in the petition. And that is what we are guided by. So it is not the law that, uh, uh, that, request, that request to Interpol must be at a particular time. The issue was raised why uh, raising, I mean, why a request on 4th April relating to a petition? 
we are not governed by time. Time is of no essence as far as a request to Interpol or any other agency of government is concerned. Another the circumstances. If we receive a petition, we form an opinion on the need to either engage Interpol, engage the local police, to en engage ICPC, FCC, we do it without any extraneous consideration for time as being of essence. Either we are uh, during election or otherwise, it's not, it's not a material consideration in affecting our discretion to refer a matter for investigation. So the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation Minister of Justice is empowered by law to prosecute criminal cases in court. So the fact that um, um, we apply to court for a uh, bench warrant or for any other process is not in any way affected by time. So, Mr. Chairman, a preliminary investigation that commenced either in December 2020 or January 2023 cannot be a basis for staying a criminal proceeding that commenced earlier in 2019. The, uh, for your information, this investigation, the criminal case as well, was initiated in 2019. So it is an on work in progress. So the idea of what we do, at what point we do it, does not matter as far as um, um, our sense of uh, reasoning and discretion is concerned. So, um, Mr. Chairman, a, parli uh, a parliamentary investigation that commenced either in 2022, which I'm making reference to this, or January 2023, cannot be a basis for state of criminal proceedings. That a parliamentary investigation has commenced should not be a basis for us stopping what we have been doing in 2019 relating to these people that were alleged to have committed one crime or the other as it relates to the product 48 uh, million barrel in contention. Our criminal case predates the investigation ongoing. So copy of the case file. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have to pause you. Sorry, yes, sir. Cover off, and that is why after the receipt of your, uh, of your invitation, we now hurried off to court to seek for a bench warrant against these people that are standing trial. No, 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 and I, over it, I because say... Because of your presentation, as oh. if we have told you to stop. No, no, no. No, no, no. But, but then you were insinuating, oh, no. Mr. Chairman, if you were insinuating that our action, subsequent actions relating to the criminal case were informed by your invitation. And I said no. It's not intended to be contentious issue any you, but the answer is no. There is no sudden uh, kind. We were not prompted by the, by the invitation of the committee. But the fact that the case was indeed first filed in 2019, two, it was pending, three, there are people that have funded justice. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. okay. um, uh, Let's just on, be on the same page. Yes, okay. on this issue, thank Mr. You. Chairman, that I am uh, addressing. Let me refer you to your letter dated the third day of April 2023, particularly paragraph 8 thereof. Paragraph 8 of the letter, Mr. Chairman, you stated, explain why you instructed the Director of Public Prosecution of the Federation to suddenly write a letter to the Interpol on 18th January 2023, requesting the tracing and location of um, related individuals, as indicated in the DPP's letter, after the committee commenced investigation on the 29th December 2022, and the individuals approached the committee. Which individuals? I am not sure. Uh, on, to, uh, on 30th December 2022, dealing, uh, desiring to provide the committee with the information when the case in court against them had not proceeded for almost four years. So the insinuation, Mr. Chairman, arriving from paragraph eight of the content of the committee's letter where the Attorney General acted, perhaps out of good faith, Simply because these purported individuals approached the committee seeking for justice, I rushed now to use the instrumentality of justice to stop them. And that is what I'm responding clearly and categorically that what the case predates the existence of the committee. It was a case that was filed in 2019. Two, these people are indeed uh, standing trials and being charged to court. So the idea of approaching the committee was indeed an afterthought 
by them, and then three, the actions of the Attorney General, Mr. Chairman, were never, by any stretch of imagination, informed or influenced by the invitation of the committee, but it was indeed a work progr in progress relating to a matter that has been pending in court as far back as 2019. That is the clarity I want to uh, clearly present for the consideration of the committee, and perhaps maybe disabused the mind of the committee in so doing. If indeed the committee is of the opinion that the Attorney General has something to hide, and that is why I'm using the instrumentality of justice against this individual. Far from it, the individuals are standing trials before a competent court of law. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, thank you, Attorney General. Yes. As much as I we resisted the attempt to while giving your presentation. Yes, sir. I equally want to draw your attention to the fact that this, this, this committee wrote to you on January 12th. Yes. And uh, for you to now make reference to letter written on April 3rd, that's four months after. Mm. It may be a mere coincidence. What suspicion? I agree entirely. Mr. Chairman. That's okay. Yes. No, that's okay. That's okay. Okay. Then, so go ahead, please. Yes. So, um, so a forming part of the document I presented, and I mark it as an extra five of table three. Uh, so, um, Mr. Chairman, question 11 is indeed overreaching. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, but then, uh, Mr. Chairman, you requested for a copy of the case file. Uh, well, with respect, Mr. Chairman, the case file, as I've stated earlier, is a work in progress. And it is what is being used and relied upon by the Office of the Attorney General to now prosecute the case. And it's what contains the investigation report I refer to and the implication of perhaps maybe and the implication is simple that this matter is of judice. And the fact that the matter is of judice the better approach, if indeed the committee feels strongly about having the case filed, is for the committee or perhaps the National Assembly to apply to be joined as an interested party before the court so that we can jointly apply for an order for the release. Otherwise, it will jeopardize what we are doing in terms of investigation. But then, if indeed you are happy with what has been provided and then there is no further need for the case file, let me have it on, uh, I mean, let me ha uh, have an idea about that. But if you feel strongly, my suggestion is please apply to be joined as interested party. I assure you, we will not object to an application if one is filed at your instance in court seeking for the release of the case file. But as it is arriving from the fact that the matter is subjudice, we are not expected to overreach the court by way of releasing case files, by way of exposing our strategy associated with the prosecution of the case, even when the matter is ongoing. That is my take on that, Mr. Chairman. Now, a response to questions 12 and 13. Uh, details relating to question 12 and 13 are provided in table two. Uh, okay. The others I will still refer to, but um, I know this is not the court of law. Yes. Sorry? I said this is not the court of law. That I very much know. My, my, but uh, whatever we do in the National Assembly, we still, even for, before the president ascends, yeah. we will still refer to you. Yeah. If we now don't like even the president refuses, we can override this ascent. Yeah. I think the Constitution empowers us to do that. Now, I, as the Chief Law Officer, I want to learn yes. equally from you. With this statement, you talked about the documents. Uh -huh. Clark, please come over. Please check the Constitution, Section 89, yes, sir. subsection 1C. And uh, can they enlighten us a bit? Okay. 29C. Especially 
Okay, it's just, uh, we just want to be guided. Thank you. Under section 88 of this constitution and subject to the provisions thereof, the Senate or the House of Representatives or a committee appointed in accordance with section 65 of the constitution shall have power. The operative word is shall. Uh, uh, two, A, procure all such evidence written or oral, direct or circumstantial, as it may think necessary or desirable, and to examine all purposes as witnesses whose evidence may be material or relevant to the subject matter. B, require such evidence to be given on oath. C, summon any person in Nigeria to give evidence on any place or, uh, or produce any document or other things in his possession or under his control and examine him uh, as a witness and require him to produce. Yes, Mr. Chairman, yes. Yes. In A, yes, pro, uh, uh, 89.1A, procure all such evidence written or oral, direct or circumstantial, as it may think necessary or desirable. Yes, I have seen it, Mr. Chairman. Are you looking, are you asking me to interpret? <laughs> okay, by way of guidance, Your Excellency, I, uh, sorry, Mr. Chairman, I want to refer you to separation. Yes, I want to refer you to separation of powers. I want to refer you to separation of powers with particular reference to sections 4, 5, 6 that spell out duties and responsibilities. The essence of uh, separation of powers is to strike a balance. And when a matter is of judice, you are invited by court tomorrow, arriving from this proceeding, you are expected to appear. And you are not, the national, sorry, the court at a number of instances had never made an attempt to stop you from the exercise of your proceedings associated with lawmaking. Yes. So arising from that, Your Excellency, you are not expected, the National Assembly is not expected to cause a situation of uh, helplessness on the part of the court in respect of a matter that is pending. Uh, uh, so the matter is of duty is pending. Yes, Mr. Chairman. You probably got this wrong. Uh, I did, yeah. Well, that is for court interpretation. When the, executive wait, and the, was, when the National Assembly wait, and the executive are in dispute, wait, it is for the court to interpret. I to interpret. Why well, wasn't referring to? I think that is what has caused even <laughs> this our sitting down for this long. Exactly. This part of it. I wasn't referring to mm. the case in court. Yes. The document. Yes. Relating to the case in court. That is case what, in court. Yeah. That's. That's what I said. Please guide us. So, because if you consider, I, I can't, I can't, we can't. Uh, sorry? So, I cannot sit here okay. and then tell you that when you said you have a court uh, case, and then tell you to tell the court to stop. No, I never said so. Sorry? Mr. Chairman, yeah. once a matter is pending in court, yeah. it's out of respect to the National Assembly, constituted authority, and indeed to your persons here that I'm appearing to discuss a matter that is pending in court. Okay. My case, legally speaking, is to refer you to court once a matter is pending. It's out of desire to support transparency and accountability that I am giving you information, details on a matter that is pending in court. You are not expected to prognose, sorry to use the word for the choice of word, to, uh, to look into a matter that is pending in court because constitutionally, constitutionally you are interfering with, ex, uh, with an issue that is pending in court. You are not expected to do that. It's okay. Um, we are guided. As far as uh, the documents being procured, as far as the speculations, let, let us put it that way, you still you are still in court and you are addressing that. So progress, please. Thank you. So, man, I refer you to paragraph 11 of your letter also. 
paragraph 11 of the letter in, con in consideration, you said, why did the judge handling this case suddenly issue a hearing notice on these individuals on 30th January 2023 after the committee commenced investigation and want, went ahead to allegedly revoke the bail without serving them the hearing notices and allowing the period provided a law for them to appear before him. Did the AGF instruct these actions by the judge or is the AGF aware of these actions by the judge? My response, Mr. Chairman, with respect is uh, it is indeed a bigger belief that a committee of the National Assembly can insinuate that the AGF is instructing or influencing a high court judge in the conduct of judicial proceedings. You know very well the separation of powers. Is it within the power of the executive, much less of the attorney general, to now uh, instruct? I can't instruct a judge. I can't instruct the judiciary. Neither can I instruct the National Assembly. So the attorney general has not done so. It was indeed a work in progress. And in the ordinary that's, course, that's taken. It's, uh, that was a dichotomous question. Yes no, or no? And no. it's a dichotomous answer, Mr. Chairman. Uh, okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. So I now proceed to, uh, to, uh, to question number 12 and 13. Uh, in this respect, Mr. Chairman, the same questions were responded to in my table 2 and an extra 1 to I and I adopt them and rely wholeheartedly thereon. Questions 14 and 18. Aside the fact that the issue, issues on approvals, payments, ETC, raised are not within the mandate of my office, I wish you, Mr. Chairman, on question 13, uh, 14 to 18, you were asking on approval uh, uh, issues on Paris Club approvals payments relating there to earlier in my submission I stated that it is not within the powers of the office of the attorney general to make a single payment and not even the office of the attorney general is not a signatory to any of the accounts being maintained by the federal government associated with um, uh, 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 with any recovery but then that um, you raise an issue whether this uh, there was any approval payments on the refunds and issues associated there too on Paris Club, you are specific. I, Mr. Chairman, arising from the terms of reference of the committee that was made available to me, I understand the limitations of the committee on the terms of reference to three issues. One, investigate the whistleblower's allegations of the uh, illegal sale of 48 million barrels of Nigeria's bonilite uh, crude in China in 2015. Two, investigate all crude oil uh, exports and sales by Nigeria from 2014 till date, and three, investigate all proceeds recovered through whistleblower policy and level of uh, compliance with the policy. Well, in as much as to my assessment of the terms, the issue of Paris Club is not part of the terms of this committee, and I have not bothered myself much to make elaborate and extensive copious response there, there too, in view of the fact that I find questions relating us around uh, Paris Club overreaching. But in the interest of support for the investigative hearing of the committee and out of respect for the desire to deepen the transparency and accountability of the system, let me state clearly, Mr. Chairman, that the issue relating to Paris Club is an issue that is extraordinarily subjudice. It's not only subjudice, but extraordinarily subjudice. Why do I say so? Mr. Chairman, I will refer the committee to about eight pending judicial matters relating to Paris Club over and above other, perhaps maybe extrajudicial consideration. One, Mr. Chairman, I I refer you hmm? Sorry? Yeah. So um, aside the fact that the issues of approval payment ETC 
raised are not within the mandate. One, I want to say that all um, those issues uh, relating to... Honorable part, Minister, please. Yes. Um, just as you have, uh, like you said, mm -hmm. you've been giving some kind of considerations. Yes. Um, we don't want you to, to forget that um, we have given in too much. Yes. Uh, ordinarily, this committee had never attended to anyone yes. whose documents we can speak to. And I thank you for that, Mr. Are Chairman. not before us. Uh -huh. So, touched, and uh, again, um, even the house rules, yes. or even the constitution that you just read to us, mm. that's why we decided not to even put you on hold at all. Yes. Okay. So, now, if you keep referring us to documents that are not before us, um, I think uh, we are not uh, being fairly treated in that way. So I'm going to advise that those documents, as you have said, once they are arranged, uh, we will want them to be properly taken care of by the Secretary because we don't fly our documents. Uh, okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my documents are in. We owe, uh, you, one. we owe you your office, your yes. staff, and whatever you present before us, mm. serious duty of care. Yes. Okay, and confidentiality. Yes. Sir. Except those that uh, has to be. Okay. So, um, we want to hold on, on to the one you are trying to explain until okay. we have them. Okay. And uh, uh, I don't know if you are concluding with that. I am indeed. And uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, sorry for interjecting. Uh, let me step the proceedings of today to be preliminary proceedings in view of the fact that the documents are indeed very copious documents and you may perhaps have recourse to the documents and further recourse to me if the need for further elaboration arises. I have undertaken to make myself available within a short test uh, notice arising therefrom. So Mr. Chairman, the documents are here presented and I take the proceedings of today to be a preliminary proceedings and undertake to make myself further available or for a review of the document by the members of the committee for the purpose of sharing more light if the need for additional light over and above what has been provided by NEFA is required. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Um, I'm going to allow members to will not just be living on rumors, especially on, on, on unconfounded ones. Yeah. And uh, you'll agree as well that we still have a lot to do with about our freedom of information. Yeah. That act, mm. um, it's not operational, let me not say at all. Because many of the reports that you have equally reported here if they have been uh, freely given to the public, as mandated and expected, especially by that act, mm -hmm. that emanated even from your own office, I'm sure that um, living on destinations, uh, rumors, and, or even some grapevines with distorted evidences uh, will have been uh, minimal. Aside what it causes, uh, among us who poisoning minds, man our laws as well. You've been seated here, you can't quantify, we can't quantify. So, please, that's another challenge. I want, we, as a committee, want you to take back to the office and uh, help us to see how well, especially judicial decisions, or even that of the executive that are mundane as these, are released to the public, so that they really have first-hand information just like court, judgments are not given in vacuum. <laughs> Everything you have said here, everybody, including the press, is convinced that we did not just pick this investigative hearing from the street and constituted the committee that we must look, look into it. They emanated from somewhere. And I, I mean, as a um, house of the, of the people, we are mandated. And equally, just as you. Uh, Concern. Now, um, you repeated severally that all the recoveries, even the ones you made by yourself, were deposited 
in the asset account recovery. Asset account recovery. And uh, asset recovery account. Because we are assuming on this part, before we conclude, we still want a guide from you, that part of what is causing the misinformation is because we, maybe the process or the procedure, we have been contravening them. Yes. And I still want to refer you to the Constitution with due respect. We are not seeking for interpretation, yeah. for a guide. Yes, okay? Yes, uh -huh. Never mind, you are, you are not under uh, oath. It's Reception 162, and they put us on a guide. Thank you. Account to be called the Federation account into which shall be paid all revenues, all revenues, yes, collected by the government. Yes, Mr. Chairman. What about it? So by way of a guide, Mr. Chairman, disbursement, revenues, I, I'm talking uh, generally speaking. Okay, revenues. Take, for example, that what you have is a revenue from Federal Revenue Service related to value added tax. Revenue generated by customs. Revenue generated by ministries, departments, and agencies of government that is arising from the interpretation of the Constitution here. There is nothing that says you cannot have a kind of a preliminary arrangement of existing accounts. But what matters at the end of the day, that revenue. If you have, for example, a revenue being maintained, dedicated to asset recovery for the purpose of transparency and accountability of it, at the end of the day, the money that goes into the asset recovery account find its way to which account? To the account being referred to under section 162, which indeed the Federation account. So the Federation is entitled to have sub accounts. But sub accounts, the content, lodgements, monies in the sub account must eventually find, some, find its way into the Federation account for the purpose of appropriation, which is the function of the National Assembly. So the existence of asset recovery account the existence of the customs account, the existence of a TSA, what do you call it, a single treasury account, is not outruled by the interpretation or by the implication of section 142 of the, 162, sorry, 162 of the Constitution. But then, what the emphasis arriving from 162 is that all the monies must naturally go into the Federation account and then it is the responsibility of the National Assembly to, to appropriate same accordingly. So that is the spirit of it. The idea of having asset recovery account is not approved by Section 162 of the Constitution, Mr. Chairman. Act. And in that law, you now establish the possibility of this asset recovery account. The poker. So where you find a breach is if the monies are utilized from the account without recourse to appropriation, without being deposited into the federation account. And at the end of the day, it's, it's about transparency. How much money do we realize from asset recoveries? you refer to the asset recovery account to get that. How much money was realized from the customs? If there exists an account established uh, relating to the custom revenue, you refer to that account to have it. But at the end of the day, if you now operate in breach by way of disbursing such money without recourse to the National Assembly for appropriation, that is why you find the breach. Like I told you earlier on, um, we'll have to 
How is Tuesday like for you? I so that uh, we would have studied the documents. I have an international meeting relating to recoveries in UK yeah. on Tuesday. But uh, no, Monday? Yeah, Monday. Monday is the holiday. Oh, okay. So you're leaving on Tuesday morning. I'll be leaving on Tuesday morning. Hopefully, I'll be back on Wednesday morning. Oh, Friday morning, I'll be back. Uh, we, are, we are afraid that you only recovered, you dumped it in the account with CBN, and did not follow up whether it actually got to the Federation account. I'm not aware. So, and uh, don't, don't tell us here that it's not your duty. Mm -mm. It's my duty. I will give you okay, information. Okay, so okay, okay. So that's why I said get prepared yes. uh, for that. I'm set. And, and a few other questions for okay. today. Not today. Oh, okay. I, just about uh, you have responded for almost three hours. Mm. We have we have about seven hundred and fifty questions for you. Yes. Where you come? Seven hundred. Seven hundred for you. Okay. Uh, well, if you are happy, <laughs> if you are happy with that, that's what it is. And strongly about it, they can take it off. But in our own case, we felt there was no substance, and we were not we were not there to uh, uh, to pursue a shadow. What we are here to do is to go for the substance, and we could not find a substance that could push. If we go to China, to where? To who? Okay, uh, Attorney General, because maybe. I'm not going to say to rest, because at the end of this investigative hearing, our report should be able to capture this and uh, either for further investigation or to just close it permanently. And you are a key critical stakeholder and a key player on the determinant, not to influence that we determine. We still need that report by the your committee that you submitted to the Mr. President. At least you got his approval, either um, because, because nothing is unofficial in front of the President as far as the nation is concerned. You must have written something, because I remember that uh, uh, one head of an agency came before us, we saw his name, and we knew he was part of the committee then, and we agreed with him where he said, no, you can't get any report from, from me, but we can get that report from you. Because well, we, though if we compel him, since mm. his name was there, mm. he had to find the reporter. But we have allowed him, but you, as uh, the custodian, we, uh, uh, we want to rule that we need that report by next, by next week Tuesday. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, let yes. me tell you categorically. That is not subjudice. No, no, no. In all sincerity, uh, uh, let me tell you, Mr. Chairman, in all sincerity, I will have stated we were informally engaged to look and advise. If the need arises for formation of a formal committee, Mr. President will now at that point consider. But if there was anyone that said, indeed, there was a report, please, in the exercise of the powers uh, vested in you, arising from the constitutional provision we have just cited, kindly. Ask him to come around and let us uh, be here jointly. For me, I have no report at my disposal, and no report was developed because there was no basis for it at all. In view of the first, I have I'm not in, I mean a party to any report in all sincerity. But if there is anyone that says one exists, please ask him to come around and let us share opinion. Maybe my memory might have failed me, and let us now join issues here. Okay. I can't produce anything that does not exist. Okay. What I have in existence is what I'm providing to you. And I'm not in any way afraid of presenting any report as far as this government is concerned. That is I, at my disposal and available at my disposal for that matter. Okay. Uh, uh, Please. Mm -hmm. Honorable Minister, you give us formal response. Yes. We are asking you formally mm. that did you at any time hear about this? Why you at any time? Yes, I have responded to that also, but 